So we're in Revelation chapter 4. And we are now going to be getting into what many consider the meat and potatoes of Revelation. And we have dealt with in the first three chapters uh, the more direct revelation to the seven churches that this is written to. And we must never forget that this is written to seven churches in Asia. And we can learn a lot from the rest of this book, but we must never forget that it was written to those seven churches. The very first verse tells us this is about things which are shortly <coughs> come to pass. And so that's another thing we need to keep in mind, that these are events, and we'll deal with Revelation 20 and 21 and 22 when we get there, but these are events largely that were for those churches. And so even though we can learn some lessons from the rest of this book, when we start to take what we read and think it's talking about us today, we make a mistake. Because here's the thing. I could have been a preacher in the 13th century, read the book of Revelation, said that's about us. And the 14th century comes. A 14th century preacher could say, well, that's about us. And the events of the 14th century happen. You could do that 15th, 16th, 17th, and all the way through to the 21st century. You could come along, and if this world goes along for another 10, 20,000, million years, whatever, they could always come along and say, well, that's about us. The, this was written to seven churches in the first century. It was about them. We can learn things, but it's about them. And I do thank Jeff for, for filling in for me last week, and some of his thoughts are going to help guide us a little bit. His lesson, remember, last week was on things that we can and cannot know. The rest of this book is going to be highly symbolic. We're going to be talking about things that we should not be taking literally because they are visions. They are visions of things just like Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Pharaoh's dream back in Genesis. Pharaoh dreamed a dream about seven fatted calves being eaten by seven lean calves or cows. And seven goodly ears of corn being devoured by seven sickly ears of corn. We understand, that's a dream. It represented what God was going to do, but God didn't send seven sickly ears of corn and they literally ate those fatted ears of corn. That was a dream, we understood that as symbolic of seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. So when we talk in this book about beasts, we talk about dragons, we talk about numbers. Remember we, we remember all the way back when we started this book, we talked about certain numbers having certain symbols, having certain meanings. But we also <coughs> must come to the realization there are just things we aren't going to know. And we should not try to take and say, well, this is absolutely what this symbol means, unless the scriptures tell us that's what that symbol means. Uh, it's not that it might not mean that, but uh, there are going to be certain stones that we read of, certain colors that we read of. And people I've read in commentary say, well, that represents this, or that represents that. And then I read the text and say, well, Sounds great, but, and it may be true, I don't know, but it's not what the scriptures literally tell us. This is a vision, and let's take it as a whole vision of the majesty that is, the, uh, as in chapter 4, we're going to see about the majesty of heaven and the th being before the throne of God. But let's not come along and think, well, that's exactly what heaven looks like. Streets of gold, uh, the the sea before the throne of God, all of the different emeralds and, and stones. That's not what heaven looks like. That's a representation so that we can understand in our terms what we're talking about. But that's not literally what heaven looks like. Heaven is not a physical place, a spiritual place. And what these images are supposed to evoke for us in chapters 4 and 5 especially is the majesty 
of God, the splendor of heaven. And if we understand that that's what the overall uh, that's what the overall picture is, we don't have to understand, all right, why did he choose this stone over that one? Or what does this color mean over that one? Some of the numbers we can know. And the reason we can know them is because other scripture deals with this. And so we're going to in this chapter as well, especially when we get to the four beasts. This is Revelation is not the only book that deals with the four beasts that we'll, that we'll see later on in the chapter. We can go back to the book of Ezekiel and see they were described there too. And we can make comparisons. And, and that's what really Revelation does a lot of. goes back to the Old Testament comparisons. And, and so we can see the similarities, see the differences, and make those points. But we should not get off into speculation. And that's what we've got to be warned against, is saying, well, this absolutely is that. The scriptures say it is, and we know it is. But if they don't, we're going to try to avoid speculating on too much because there's no use speculating. If God hasn't revealed it to us, he hasn't revealed it to us. It's not important. And so let's read, where's my clicker? Let's read chapter 4, the entire chapter, uh, to get the entire picture of what we're talking about. We'll start with Jeff. Uh, assuming I get this thing in. No. Batteries again. Um, the batteries have died. I don't know if we have any more. Well, I will have to go old fashioned. Uh, let's read verses 1 to 11 of Revelation 4. We'll start with Jeff. We'll read one verse each. After this, I looked and behold the door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there at the appearance of Jasper and Hanedia, and around the throne was a great golden at the appearance of the emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the throne were twenty-four elders. Taken to heaven 
to see what things would happen in the future. That's not me uh, saying that. It's exactly what the end of verse 1 says. What things must take place after this? So we are now, we are now, this is a spectacular view. I don't get to go to heaven. I don't think any of you have been to heaven either, right? This is, this is a vision that John had seen about things that was going to happen in the future. John was in the spirit. Where was he in chapter 4? Where did he go according to verse 2? Stood before what? Before the throne in heaven. Stood before the throne in heaven. And what he viewed was an awesome view. And I compare this to what we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'll get verses 1 to 4. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this, was, uh, this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Now the third heaven in when we, when we talk about uh, Jewish literature, is heaven. The first heaven is this earth and the sky. The second heaven is the what we would call outer space. And the third heaven is heaven, where God dwells. And so Paul is saying, and we can, we can discuss whether this was Paul speaking. I believe this is Paul speaking about himself. Uh, he, he does, just because of what uh, he says later on in the chapter about this thorn in the flesh that God gave him, so that he would not be puffed up by the things that he has seen. Uh, this is where that thorn in the flesh, this chapter, is, deals with that. And so he says, this man was caught up into paradise and he heard things that man could not be uttered. That man does not utter. And other than that, we don't know what Paul heard because he couldn't tell us what he heard. Uh -huh. and, but he was taken up into heaven. Well, that's a similar thing to what happened to John, only this time John could reveal what he saw. He was allowed to reveal what he saw. And the view he saw, I consider awesome. So I, the first question on our page says, uh, describe the one who sat on the throne. Um, that, that would really start in verse three of chapter four. Describe the one who sat on the throne. What was the first thing, uh, Jeff? Um, my version starts off saying, uh, like the one who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. All right, so, so was he a uh, jasper and a sardius stone? No. <laughs> and that's the point we're making. That's how we know that this is not <coughs> literal. It is like. And in, if you've ever studied English, English uh, literary devices, what they call them. This is a simile. Anytime, uh, if it's a metaphor, it doesn't use like or as. That's the difference. It's generally what I learned from, from English was metaphors are uh, comparisons, but they don't use like or as. If there's a like or an as there, it's a simile. But it is a comparison. The one who sat before the throne was like Jasper. And the English standard has carnelian, and Jeff's version uh, has sardius. What what does that give a picture of? Like those are two stones. Do anyone know what those stones look like? Yeah, they're not if you don't, that's it's not it's not an issue. But Cal. Well, I have four translations. Five version says. Jasper and its fiery, um, no, the cliff. And he who sat there, the parents, like the crystalline brightness of Jasper and their fiery sons. Okay. Sardius or Carnelian was, according to my dictionary, a semi precious stone consisting of an orange or orange red variety of calcium. 
whether or not that's whether or not I'm not going to say that's exactly what it has to be, uh, but but so we could get sort of an orangey red type of stone. Whereas jasper, now I looked this up because I was going to put pictures up on the screen, and people can't people can't agree as to whether or not this is what we would call jasper, which is a reddish stone today, or it's described here and in other places more like what we would call a diamond, able to, able to uh, serve as a prism for light. It's more of a, what, what did yours say, Cal? You had a crystalline? The crystalline brightness of Jasper and the fiery sardis encircling the throne. Oh, we won't go there yet. Uh, but uh, a crystalline. Now, if you take a look, I looked up Jasper yesterday. It's a pretty red, solid stone what we would call Jasper today. Of course, whether, like as far as they might have different names for stones than we do. We call, we call dinosaurs dinosaurs. And people say, well, where are the dinosaurs in the Bible? And I can go to a couple places that sound a lot like dinosaurs. Now, they don't call them dinosaurs. That's because we call them dinosaurs. The Bible doesn't necessarily have to call them the same thing we call them. And at that time, Jasper could have been more like what we call diamond. And so, all we have to really understand about that is that these were precious stones. These were expensive stones. And so the person who sat on the throne uh, looked, we could say, like we would expect these stones to look. Mad majestic. Uh, they would be able to shine light. Uh, act as a prism. In Revelation 21, verse 11, I think we're to reign. Uh, you want to get Revelation 21, verse 11? Having the glory of God is reigning like most of her to rule, like at Jasper, through those crystal. All right, so this is, where, this is where I was telling you about Jasper being as clear as crystal. Revelation 21 returns to the throne scene uh, all the way back. At the end of this book. And so the person who sits on the throne is majestic. That's what that's what's being talked about. The view of God is this way. Now, now we have uh, the next question, which is describe the twenty-four elders who sit around the throne. Um, we have twenty-four elders who sit around the throne. Verse 4. They were in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Okay, so we have 24 of them. Now, we have 12 and 12. Remember, remember the number 12 it sort of represents God's people. Uh, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, and we sort of, like as far as that, and so that, that number is, is symbolic of God's people. And we won't get into a little bit of that in a second, but they're wearing crowns of gold. Okay, these are precious, again, another precious mineral. Uh, we, we revere gold as being highly expensive, uh, just as it was then. It's rare. But they were wearing crowns of gold. They were clothed in white. What does white usually symbolize in Scripture? Purity. Uh, that's right. We, uh, our, as we'll discuss in David, when we discuss David later this morning in our lesson, he wanted to be clothed in white. We've already seen in this book where Jesus told some of the churches, you need to be clothed in white. Uh, remember, that was, I think, the church at Laodicea. Uh, in chapter 3. White is always the symbol of purity. So these these people, these elders, sitting around the throne, they were pure. They, were, they didn't have any sin in them. And we will read about these elders in other chapters of Revelation. So we're going to lead a lot of, of that to when we get there. Now I've got a question. Who are the elders? That's sort of a trick question. In this chapter, do we know? 
No, this would go into Jeff's things we cannot know. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about who these elders are. And because, uh, and I've read in commentaries, well, 24 represents God's people. And so these were maybe the representations of those saved under the old covenant and then those saved under the new covenant. We get, well, perhaps, but it's not said here. And so they're, because they're not identified, it's not important who they are, uh, or at least when, when we read of them now, it's not important who they are. They're there. But one thing we can know about them is that they are righteous men. Because only righteous men are going to be in heaven. This is not, this is not talking about all of mankind worshiping God. Because all of mankind is not going to be in heaven. Only the righteous are going to be there. These are righteous men who worship around God's throne. And I do make a point. Think about it that man should be able to be around God's throne and able to worship Him directly. We worship God today, but we worship God here on this earth. We're not in heaven right now. We don't get to worship God directly from heaven. We're here on this earth. But think that we are able to worship from our, our, around God's throne. What a blessing that is. Uh, we'll come, uh, James, you want to get Revelation 21, verse 3? Uh, and Dion, if you can see it, verse 22. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And there is some unknown Revelation 21 is describing this new Jerusalem. And I'm going to leave a lot of that to when we get to chapter 21. But it says, Behold, God's dwelling place is now with man. Not with everyone. Those who are the saved. He will dwell with them. He, they will be his people. And he, they, and he will be their God. And there was no temple. We're used to temples to worship in. There's no temple in that city. For God is the temple. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the Lamb, of course, is Jesus. No temple. We can worship God directly. We don't have to go to some place to worship God. And that's really what we're getting a picture of here. We got this picture of the one who sits on the throne. He is glorious. He is worthy of honor. And there are 24 elders around the throne. We've got the picture, if we can get in our mind, of a throne and someone who's sitting on it. Very glorious. And there's 24 people around the throne. And they are worshiping from around the throne. This brings us to verse 5 and the next question. According to verse 5, what proceeded out of the throne? Like of thunder. Lightning, peals of thunder. All right. When we see yesterday, I don't know. Maybe it was different where you live. Uh, we had a lightning storm. Uh, at least uh, at the east end of the city, we did. Uh, I think on Friday we had a lightning storm. What usually happens when we hear thunder and see lightning? What does that usually evoke in our thoughts? Stormy. What happens to our pets if we have pets when when there's uh, lightning and thunder? It depends on the pet, but dogs I, I know are usually this way. They run and hide. They're, they run and hide. They're scared. And so now we have the man, the one who sits on the throne. We have lightnings and thunderings and voices. Now this is very powerful. Jeff was saying that about storms, our, our general rains, our general rain that we get, a light rain, doesn't usually come with thunder and lightning. Usually it's just a very calm, light rain, and it comes and goes. When we get thunderstorms, though, they're highly charged electrical storms along with the rain that comes with them. The rain is usually a lot harder. 
than a regular rain. Uh, Naomi was saying she got hail the other day. Hail can come with these storms. And lightning can cause damage. Uh, I was at uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin last um, Sunday, but on Thursday of that week, uh, me and my uncle were at the building doing, doing some work, and there was a crack of lightning and thunder, and it was right at the building. Well, we didn't know that the building was hit until Sunday when we came and PowerPoint projector didn't work because one of the electrical uh, pieces was hit by lightning and fried. Didn't find that out. The Bible class teacher was a little surprised. He really wanted to use it uh, and couldn't use it. And the microphones, they had to reset because they were hit by lightning too. Very powerful lightning is and it's usually pretty frightening. We don't like to go out. We might like to go out. Some people like to go out and stand in the rain. But when it's a thunder and lightning storm, we generally don't like to go out in those storms. We can be hurt in those storms. Now, this thunder and lightning, does that remind you of anything that we read someplace else in Scripture about God and thunder and lightning? I don't remember, maybe perhaps from the Old Testament. Maybe from the book of Exodus. How did God present himself to the children of Israel? And they went to Mount Sinai and wandered in the wilderness. They were afraid. Uh, they were afraid to approach him. Why? Those thunders and lightnings. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, we're going to come up to Leicester. Uh, we'll read one verse each, 18 through 20. people do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be for you that you may not sin. Alright, so we're at Mount Sinai. The children of Israel left Egypt and they've come to Mount Sinai and God had uh, appeared to them here on this earth in a cloud, smoke uh, like as far as I remember it was the cloud uh, and the fire and they saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning <coughs> And they were afraid. They said, Moses, don't you let God speak to us. We, we're going to die if we, if we hear God speak to us. You speak to us instead. And that was a very frightening picture. And, it's, it's, and God, when you think of God speaking, I mean, we weren't there when God said, let there be light. And there was light. What what did that sound like? I don't know. Scriptures just tell us. Uh, Let there be light and there was light. We don't know what it sounded like. But God is powerful. Uh, when God speaks, everyone listens. And there was th the thundering, lightnings, voices. It was very awesome to stand in front of. Awesome meaning awe. Uh, this is, this is quite the scene that is being depicted here uh, in Revelation chapter 4. So we've got the one sitting on the throne. He's brilliant as these, as these, uh, uh, as Jasper and, and Sardis. There's the 24 elders sitting around him, worshiping him. When he speaks, there's thunders and lightning. Very magnificent. Anything else before we move on that we've seen so far that you want to catch up to verse 5? Okay, moving on to the next question then, question 4. What did the seven lamps burning before the throne represent? And again, this is not speculation because 
Revelation foretells us. What did the seven lamps burning before the throne represent? Seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God. Does anyone remember in Revelation who that was? Who that represented? No. That was that. No, it wasn't Christ. <coughs> we have Christ, God the Father, and then we have the Holy Spirit. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, Cala. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, praise to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Okay, so Jesus is speaking. He says, grace and peace to you who was and is and is to come. That's God the Father. And from the seven spirits. Christ in the book of Revelation is going to be referred to as the Lamb, not the seven spirits. God the Father, the one who's sitting on the throne. And the seven spirits, remember, what does seven represent in the book of Revelation? Holiness, perfection, completeness. And so it's not saying that there are seven Holy Spirits. Remember, this is representative language again. Completeness of God. God. The completeness of God. God the Father, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And so the, before the throne are the seven spirits of God. It's a description of God. God is spirit. And so that's who's standing or, or sitting on the throne and surrounding the throne. Again, this is quite a picture that we have built up for ourselves. And then we get the last question we'll deal with this morning. I don't want to get into the beasts. Uh, that, that's a little bit more of a more in-depth topic. What was in front of the throne in verse 6? So, and before the throne was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Again, is it literally a sea of glass? No. But, if you can imagine, we understand what crystal is. Uh, if, you have, if you have actual crystal um, uh, utensils and other things, you'd understand what that is. It's like... Uh, it was, it was described as a sea like glass. It wasn't a sea of water. It wasn't a sea of anything else, but it was very beautiful to look at. And what I want us to remember, we're going to keep this in the back of our minds. We need to remember this sea because we're going to come back to it in Revelation 21. What does a sea generally do? When you have a land mass over here, and a land mass over here, and a sea or a stream in the middle, what does it do? Separates. It separates. And so there is a separation before the throne of God by this sea. Uh, and let's remember that there is this separation because later on we're going to find <coughs> in Revelation, John says, and there is no sea anymore. But there is a separation from the throne and those around the throne and everything else. And so next week, and we will stop maybe just a couple minutes early, but next week what we're going to take a look at, and what you can take a look at is verse 7 and 8. We have these four beasts that are sitting. So we have the 24 elders that are around the throne. And we also have these four beasts, or these four living creatures. And they're each going to have a different face. And what I want you to do is see if you can, if you have your concordance, you can go to your computer, find where in Ezekiel these beasts are talked about. Because they are there as well. And they will look exactly the same. They're going to be described exactly the same. And we're going to describe what these, who these beasts are and what they're doing before the throne. And uh, because we can, using Ezekiel and using Revelation, determine who these beasts are. Uh, there's not going to be much of a mystery 
when when we combine those two uh, of those two um, scenes, one in Ezekiel and one in Revelation, and we'll describe what they're doing, and that will bring us to the end of chapter four. Then, Lord, well, in chapter five, which you'll get that material next week, is a continuation of chapter four. Chapter four is a short chapter. Chapter five is uh, a continuation of that chapter. And what we're going to do for the remainder of this study, we're not going to. We're, we spent, I think it was twelve weeks. 12 or 14 weeks in the first two chapters of this book. We are going to pick up the pace a little bit because we're not going to be speculating on a lot of things. We're going to try to paint the pictures in our mind of what John is describing here. So we have this throne scene and we're going to get a continuation of that, chapter 5, and then we're going to get these visions of what was to pass.